I think it's uh, it's a great uh, moment for us that uh, we discover how um, Larry with the script start from the paper and how make this change from the word to the light, word to the movement and word to a cinematography. It's really amazing. I think that we, uh, all of us, we enjoy a lot to hear uh, this mystery, these secrets from uh, the DOP of Joker and the, all these master films that he, he done before. As a as a nice uh, DOP, the Sarah is with me, and I, I think all of us we are excited to know about all these yeah. details somebody i can michelle wrote that shot tech changed my life it is my favorite too yeah, and it is yeah. for many of us um uh, i remember 2019 i mean before i go through that like it's very good that we're talking with a director shahram because not every director is visually rich and visuals and images are important for them sometimes they want to just capture the uh, actors action but uh, for some directors like Shahram, uh, it's important to use light, to use contrast, to tell a story in every frame. What I love about Joker, Larry, and I think you discussed this in so many videos, like um, the ones, the interviews you have online, that every shot of Joker, if you pause it, it's like a it, it tells a story. Visually telling a story is like from all those comic books. Um, and the same applies to school. I remember when I started to teach at schools, and some of my colleagues are here, Kiara and some other. Uh, so we were telling students, so for example, recreate an uh, interview scene. OK, for a new student, it can be anything. But when immediately you show them some world-class standard from a movie or like you know a two-shot from uh, Godfather that is using hard light, immediately you're elev elev elevating the level of that student so they're trying to reach a high standard and that became a standard in um, for so many of my classes that we were creating light contrast i mean kiara is a master of that please do speak kiara if you want to do and uh immediately students love to play around uh with all those color contrasts that you're a master of and please do talk about it today because i know shot deck has changed that into color palette and these are the new things similar shots um so yeah talk us through what yeah. has changed uh in shot deck since 2019 that you introduced that in camera image and we were all like "Ooh, what's that <laughs> I mean, you know, Shatek was born 100% out of necessity, mostly first and foremost, just because it was a communication thing that was happening anyway, which is the first step of me trying to get a job was to go rent DVDs, books, tear sheets, create a little bit of an image deck to, to express my vision for the film. But then once we started prepping the job then the then really this sort of need for reference material became more even more important and then all the way through production so you know because i use it every day the biggest thing frankly that you know what happened between 2019 which is it was in a very small beta of a couple hundred people was and it happened still today because i'm prepping a movie in new york right now um and i use shot take every single day and every single time I find a movie that's not on the site, I go, what the? And it's like, so even with the biggest thing between, let's say, 2019, when there were 50,000 images, and now there's 1.2 million, we still have a long way to go with content. And so the number one thing is trying to be the most comprehensive image database for the moving picture, right? And, and we continue to obviously make huge strides. But interestingly enough we still find at times we're missing some stuff and obviously there's new great stuff happening all the time uh we introduced tools of, of course like you mentioned over the last uh year or so or or longer that were um you know similar shots which is a real big thing color palette being able to switch more specifically from color palette music videos of course as carol mentioned 
commercials will come this year, which is obviously a daunting thing simply because there are, you know, hundreds of millions of commercials probably over the course of, of history. But similar to music videos, we'll find a curation and begin somewhere. Um, you know, there'll be an app. The Mac, the iOS version of the app will be re uh, released probably by the end of this week. And then the Android, there were just a couple, couple of little bugs that we're just trying to tidy up before the Android goes out in a week or so after that. But, um, you know, and then future stuff in terms of just continuing not only to be more comprehensive and expand the database, but, you know, clips, which in music videos, you can see a version of the clips. We actually have a version of that already existing on the site, but, um, but we just have to work through some of the sort of, uh, you know, complexities of, of releasing that part of it. But, you know, I, I, like I said, I still use it every day. So for me, I'm like uh, a constant beta tester of, of the product because I'm constantly seeing things that need improvement. And I, we always listen to every email and, uh, and there's just so much more we want to do with it in so many ways in which we want to improve it. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 uh, you know, I, I can just speak to the way I use it now and, and I break down, I start my process of prepping a movie almost exactly the same every single time which is once I read the script, it's not even different than 20 years ago. If I'm trying to get the job, I build a deck. Once I get the job, I start breaking down every single scene and just start looking for, for references that feel inspirational. And a lot of times those references are never one-to-one -one from what the movie ends up looking like, but they just might be a, a conversation starter. They, they might just be one element of it. I want to remind myself you know, and, and also it's a discovery of what the look and feel of the movie is, right? The first point of discovery when you make a movie or any project is going to be the material, right? So the script, the idea, anything like that. And and the conversations you have with your collaborators, whether it be the director or production designer, are going to be conversations not just technically about what do we need out of this set or this location, but what do we want emotionally out of this scene? And then across the whole spectrum of the movie what are we seeking for emotionally for the audience to have and and as you spoke to earlier you know when you sort of imagine every shot as having a value for the for the audience it's just a great way to constantly think about what is the point of this shot uh and and the point could be simply because you need to communicate something right it could be very functional but also, even if it's functionality, is there a way in which you can sort of interpret the emotional perspective of the audience towards the characters or the characters' perspective towards each other to help add another layer, subconscious layer, psychological layer to their experience? And it's great because one of the daunting things about making anything is there are a thousand ways you can choose to to tell a story and every filmmaker and every dp and every artist will tell it a different way and sometimes that can create a real you know you can run through the motions of like we could do this handheld we could do this long lens we could do this this and it becomes a little paralyzing so when you sort of attach some rules of your own to those scenes or to those to the general like vibe of the whole thing it allows you to sort of start to narrow those choices, which for me is really essential because, because yes, like you can actually reshoot the same scene 20 times in a completely different way and all might be right. And so that, that can be really, really hard to do sometimes, particularly in prep. To add to that, I realize for so many emerging uh, directors of photography, what you say is the hardest thing. It's easy to say like the colors and uh, the style, but to be consistent all over the shots is so difficult. It's at least a challenge for me. So you say you, you create those shot decks, which I hope you can run us through later on. Uh, yeah, sure. That we can share and we can turn off our uh, pictures and you can share your screen. But how do you, I mean, any tips? I know it's, it comes with practice, but how do you keep it consistent as a style, like hard light, soft light, color contrast, like Joker is so colorful. It's like really a comic book. 
I haven't seen Black Adam, but like, do you have a set rules or does Shot Deck help you achieve? Just walk us through how to be consistent, how to create a style. Yeah, well, I think it comes in part like the process I just described. Like for Joker, you know, some of the style comes out of just trying to recreate a time of a time and place, right? So some of the colors color palette and some of the style comes from the mixed light that I always appropriated with the 70s and 80s. And so when when we set out to make Joker and we said, you know, and I could I could probably even share my screen just because um sure is that I, I rarely use Google. Is that present now? Yeah. Larry, you can uh, present. And does no. it allow you to just let me just see here for a second? um hold on let me just see if i present now will it just allow me to just present this one yeah share screen i think yeah, you can, like, yeah there we go yeah. yeah you can see that now no can, did you press uh, on that hour? yeah yeah we but have you it. can't see the screen i yeah thought I shared it. yes you can yes you can see dex if i open it now you still see my screen yes yes right I mean, listen, I, my decks are crazy. They're so dense. And then I have archives of like hundreds of decks. I build so many decks. I mean, I, that's like my whole thing is, uh, is, is constantly building decks. You can see, I can't show you these decks right here. I'm putting my mouse over here for bride and bride sets because that's a, that's a, uh, a new film. And I can't show you the one for Juliet, which is the new Joker. Joker too. But look, like I'll even do this. So I can show you this, right? Uh, so I'll show you this. Let's tell us about it. Yeah, I'll just show you like an example of how this is a small example of how I use shot deck, right? Which is which is going into the color timing process, right? And so even though this was like a very small thing, as we went towards the final DI, of course, I've created a very specific LUT that I like to, and, and it's very, it's once I create it, and usually it happens during prep and over the first week of shooting, that's all I use for the rest of the movie. But as we get to the final, you know, stage, and is, is I, sometimes I just want me and my colorist, Jill Bogdanovich, to just have a reminder of a contrast and color and skin tone for us to just like level out in case we get you know, there's so many ways you can go in a in a DI, and we always stay very close to the dailies. But sometimes it's a little bit of a reminder, and sometimes because, like on Joker and the new Joker, we shot the same camera, which is Alexa six Alexa sixty five, which is a digital sensor, and we actually retested film, we tested IMAX film, we tested all that again, but we still chose the same format we chose before. I think in large part because we really understood. Uh, the way it allowed us to be really improvisational with things and 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 shoot in in a style that that gave us a certain freedom right even though i love obviously still love the way film looks but some of the the sort of the specifics of film and the way that just chemical film and this is why so many of these have chris nolan images in them even though these two images are from chris mangus this movie kez is the inherent contrast and color of skin tones in film when it's sort of less touched by a DI. And so that comes in the form of certainly cyan and the highlights, and sometimes there's a little yellow in the blacks and little things like that that we want to just remind ourselves of. So even through the entire process, we're still kind of using Shot Tech as just a, a leaping off point for our conversation, right? But you know, Romeo, which some of you have seen some of these decks, but you know, when I started, this Romeo was a working title for Joker. Um, and so, you know, some stuff I'm just dropping in there in the same way as I always say to people, if you're just starting to use Shot Deck, and if you're a student or something like that, the thing I sort of always say is I say build three decks or four decks, one for color, one for composition, one for lighting. You can have a fourth one maybe for tone, whatever that means to you. But if you just did color, lighting, composition, and you just scrolled through brow shots, 
and just start dropping in any image that catches your eye. Like, this is quite cool, right? This is from a music video I haven't seen before. I'm going to add this to a deck right now because I like it. So I'm just going to add it to the deck for Bride. So I can talk to the director about it on Monday. But, but you know, and I might open up Bride. And you can see the first three decks I built on Bride were lighting, tone, color. And then I start doing composition, you know, those kind of things. Right? So I might just add this to something more specifically like lighting for now. Okay. So, so I still do this. I literally still start a project with those same three decks, but anyone can do that. But what I would suggest is just do that and just grab anything that catches your eye. Don't think about it too much. Just literally, if it catches your eye, drop it into one of those folders. And I always think that like, if you do this process, it'll start to inform you a little bit about your own personal aesthetic. It may even teach you some things that are consistent to what you like, right? It, it, it'll probably tell you a little bit of something about yourself. So when I'm approaching a movie, I do exactly the same thing. So when I was approaching like the beginning of Joker, right? I knew what the script was. It says it takes place in 1981 and you know, those kind of things. And so here I'll go back to that deck for Joker. Oh, this is another thing I didn't, I, if you guys don't notice this, this is something we added as well, but not everyone sees that it's possible. This little thing here at the search bar, if you hit this, you can drag an image outside of Shot Deck into Shot Deck and it'll find similar images to that image. So it could be a picture of yourself. It could be a picture you took out on the streets. It could be something you found on Google Images. Whatever it is, you can drop something outside Shot Deck into here and it'll find similar images. So that's super cool. We added that uh, somewhat recently. But anyway, getting back to the Dex thing. And Sarah or Sharam, just feel free to jump in if you have any questions as I as I talk through. I just but, wonder, is that AI the one that you drop a picture? Oh, I think it's I think it's not. I think it's not even AI. I think it works very similar to Google Image Search. It's it's not high tech stuff, but it's Amazing. but it's um you know it uses some form of machine learning, of course. You know, but it's not going to be updated. Uh, upgrade. Yeah. Updated. Yeah, like we built our similar shots bespokely, like we didn't take it off the shelf. And that has some components of machine learning. Everything we do, we still hand tag most of the movies on, most of the images on Shot Tech, almost all of them. You know, if you look at um, any shot on Shot Tech and you look at all the categories of that shot, you know, all these, all the metadata points down here. There's only a handful of ones we've only recently started using some AI that we've built internally to do, but we trained it very specifically because we found that you know out of the box stuff didn't work that well. And and of course, there are some things that AI just actually, or not AI, but certainly machines can just do better than humans. Like we used to hand hand put in the aspect ratio. But what we realize is that's information that's gathered from outside sources and stuff like that. But the truth is aspect ratio, at least the image that's on the site, and we have a category called original aspect ratio that's hidden, but we'll we'll put out originally, is that's just one, that's just literally measuring. <laughs> so like a computer does that better, right? And and so we started realizing there's some scalability we can do using some machine learning. But anyway, getting back to uh to like just the Joker deck, which is this, you know, so I would just start building decks. You can see this is the color deck for, for Joker, right? When you, because you asked about that, Sarah, right? Yes, please and talk so us about I, color. <laughs> yeah, very similarly, right? I'm just like starting the process, um, grabbing images that respond to me as feeling something that feels like the tone of joker and even though like this is a much more this shot from inherent vice is way more primary in a way to the blue than we use in joker but what i did respond to was it was an engaging frame to my eye in the in the sense that it, it actually has mixed color in it right yeah. and you know these shots like this shot from good time just represents that uncorrected fluorescent cyan that i really respond to when you have real fluorescence that still have all that green spike. And here's a movie from 1970 something, right? Fat City, 1972, but also an example of a movie from the seventies in which they were shooting in real environments. They didn't have a Stara and Titan tubes 
with full RGB color and dimming. They just had a fluorescent back there and a 3200, you know, tungsten film stock read that fluorescent as this really vibrant cyan. So sometimes it's just me jumping into, you know, you know, things that feel like, like this might be more of even a contrast thing than a lighting, the shot from the master, you know, or these shots from killing of a sacred deer also mixed light, right? Like a shot like this has the uncorrected daylight source on the right and this tungsten vanity light. And so hey, in a way, I, you know, can I ask about the previous image. Uh, yeah. The, Which one? This, the window. Yeah. This one. This yeah. one. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, yes. Larry, you start um, in, in your mind. My question is about the ex mystery of your thinking, the function of the um, that you know only about yourself. When you read the scenario, you you focus on the detail. You start from the shot, or you start from the atmosphere of the plan or sequence you start from the general structure or after that you go to the shot or you start from the shot this shot give you the dna of the lighting and the, you know development of how you plan the structure of the cinematography for a part of a film or for general the Generally, the, for the I film. mean, I guess I'll give you a specific shot, right? I think I know what you mean, right? Which is like, so I'm gathering all this sort of ideas in my head, right? And I've always liked mixed light. You could go back to, you know, to to like anything in my in my work and see that, like, I've always liked the uncorrected fluorescent. I've always liked those kind of things, right? Um. Like if you go back to, you know, I'm just trying to see, you know, some shots from from other films, you know, even the shot from Paul or something, you know, um, hold on, I just passed it, I think. So I could go for another movie. A lot of these are Joker images, of course. Oh, here's a good shot. This is from Dan in real life in 2007, right? We it's like this. It's, right that's an example of very similar color palette in a way to joker right and this yeah. is like a movie about you know a dad who's you know has three girls and he's trying to find love and this is supposed to be him at early morning and you know and and just doing the laundry by himself before his kids wake up and all that so some of that stuff's in there already but okay let's just use joker as an example to what you were talking about you know in the design of a of a shot sometimes it's functional right it's like haha's which is the place in which you know he has he, he you know he this is where the movie begins right it's the first shot of the movie um the uncorrect the half corrected daylight that half corrected daylight is something i've always appreciated in those movies of the 70s and 80s when they started taking cameras out of the studio and they started putting them into like real world is you had to make a decision if you fully corrected for the daylight and put an 85 filter in or shot with daylight stock then everything inside is going to be double warm all the tungsten light so the best way was you sort of split the difference right put an 81e half half warming filter in or you would just basically let the let the world out there go a little blue and then the the, the world inside go a little warmer and then in here it was like a combination of just functionality right in all these environments we're trying i try to almost rarely if any time try to put any lights inside the set so i'm constantly just having conversations with the production designer of what can we add functionally in this set so that it all works somewhat 360 right so you can see in here we have a mixture some stuff came from just visiting some of these locations and seeing like these old industrial uh fluorescents up top and saying well that looks good but then oh but then maybe they also would add some little hi-hats you know with tungsten light over the sink and over where these guys are playing cards you know so it's a mixture of a bunch of sources and 
even though the window light is doing a decent amount, we know that in the other side of the space, we're going to need some light. And so let's make it functional with practicals as opposed to me sort of putting a bunch of movie lights in there and hiding them, right? So sometimes it's a little bit of function. Sometimes it's, and then it's a question of just what type of bulbs to put in here to give some of that mixed light vibe that we're going for. But like sometimes it's it's about talking to the director and trying to, you know, convince them to block something a little bit differently, right? So this scene here with Arthur and his mom, right? That came a little psychologically out of, I wanted his home life to be, to be like basically warm with his mom early on in the movie. As, as he goes and he kills her later, it's much cooler, right? That hospital scene when he suffocates her is a totally different, it's aggressive, the light's coming through, it's flaring, it's like all this sort of anger, like the light is angry, right? And it's colder and it's green, it's ugly. Here it's like we want it early in the movie for it to be sort of this kind of sweet little moment where him and his mom watch watch TV. And this is like something I just tried to see if I could get Todd to build into the blocking. And you don't, you're not always successful because first of all, it's convincing actors to do something for a cameraman, which is always, you have to sneak it around because if they think they're doing it for the camera, they'll almost never say yes. They'll say, well, what's my motivation? Which basically means, fuck you, I'm not doing it. Um, the minute they say, what's my motivation? You've lost, right? So mostly I try to talk to Todd and I say, well, you know, we can use lighting here to kind of like switch the mood of the scene during the scene, right? So he oh brings God. her food over, you know, and I'll play this for a second here. You know, he brings her food over. I don't know where this is in the oh, scene. You know, and even like, the choice of like the, the being like a TV, TV that goes kind of blue. Old movies, because again, TV light is 5600, so it's going to go blue. And even though we could correct it and make it perfect, trying to intentionally make it not perfect, right? And in this scene, like 90% of this is all practical, right? We put a little LED on the TV to mimic the TV light, and that's like the blue edge that's on Joaquin here, or even hitting her face. But this lamp, which was chosen very specifically because I could put a bigger bulb in it and it could actually like the actors, is doing most of the heavy lifting here, right? But then when he goes, oh, um, the Murray Franklin show starting, I asked Todd to see, well, what if he turned off the light? Like in the same way as like you're getting ready to watch a movie, like, yeah, of course they could keep the light on. Most people, a lot of people watch TV with their lights on. But I was like, well, if we take this warm scene and then shift it when Murray Franklin starts, and would it be like, could you get Joaquin to turn the light off? And so I think it's the next clip that'll show that because these are only in like 20 second clips, but but basically getting him to lean over, it doesn't show it here. And so that the whole second half of the scene when he starts fantasizing about being a Murray Franklin is now a totally different tone because now it's all blue, right? And so it's that's just like a an idea thinking about the location and just now trying to sort of get the director on board to use lighting during a scene right it could be like opening the wind like you see it in other people's movies but it always has a certain it's like the lighting can actually also be a character in the scene um and so you're not going to always find those opportunities but but um but if you can they you know they they add something even if it's just subconscious for the audience you know i think that's a very good example that it's important that the director receives this message or recommendation from dp you can't do Amar anything Strait. without them like they have to be on board it's the director's medium and so they have to receive it but also believe that it's important or believe that it matters right and it's tough it's not it's listen trust me i spend most of my time during prep negotiating or trying to like you know like find a a, a bridge with the director in which they also recognize um, the value of, of some of those decisions, you know? Larry, I think it's a mystery 
of the lighting that has a corresponding and the, uh, you know connection, the lighting ratio and the timing. When you go from the um, light to the darkness, also it affects on the you know the the time, not the physical time, the time and the tempo of the uh, that plan and the scene that connected to each other also affect on the editing of the film. Do you think? Yes. Mm. Yeah, for sure, for sure, because. You, I mean, listen, the, one of the most important things you can do as a cinematographer is really understand the edit, right? Like my first step when I prep, I often will just make shot lists on my own regardless of with the director. I also obviously do a page turn and then go through stuff with the director. But I like to just have a little, like I'd like to do the process on my own regardless. And my first step of the process is to make the shot list editorially. I can't just make shot lists because, yeah, of course you go, well, all this and that, but I want to understand where in my mind when I read the script, the next edit point comes. And, and then from there, you then can reorganize it into like an overhead with little arrows and go, okay, these five shots are in this direction and find the most efficient way to like shoot the scene. And that's when you're sort of like executing the idea. But the first step is, and even if I'm talking to a director, who doesn't even understand shot listing because they're more of a writer director or whatever it might be that's okay they wrote the script which means they were editing whether they knew it or not right when they say you know they i mean they say it all the time and i always i you know partly can't stand the open on a thing and pull back to reveal because i'm always like do you really want to pull back from that picture of the dad and, and his son on a night table all the way. It's like that. Think about what that means. You, you might want that. That might actually be what you want, but it often just means it might really mean I cut to reveal. Right. But it's like a different way of saying something. So you sort of sort of analyze what they want, which is but they, what they really want is they're saying, I want to see this first before I see this. Well, then they're already editing. Right. And so I like to just understand the edit more than anything, because it's also just if you think about where the wide shot, let's say you do a wide master or where is that going to fit in the edit? Right. Is it going to be the first shot or is it going to be a shot in the middle? or Is it going to be the, the way you cap the scene at the end? Because that's also going to inform like if you cut to it, what's happening in that moment, because you're probably not going to use it in the middle where the acting is like. So then understand that and go. Because it also allows you to say, okay, we can move on out of this master because I'm probably going to use it here. And I got enough of that to like get me into the scene, whatever that is, you know? Um, and that's really important. And I think as a DP, you really need to understand that as well because it also allows you in executing the day and helping your directors like, you know, make the day for you to sort of also understand what this, the purpose of this shot is. Because, and this is something, I've always believed in. I like shooting every single piece of coverage, top to bottom. I Everyone love the whole scene. Like I don't shoot sh like a shot just for this, a shot just for this, a shot just for this, because even though you might know this is what it's for, you can find amazing moments in a part of the scene that it's not for, simply because you know it. You know, sometimes it's like, I, and, and it was a great operator I worked with years ago who he always was like, roll a little early and cut five seconds after the director says cut. Because sometimes it's like, or if you're shooting it over the shoulder and the actor leaves the frame that you're shooting, that shot's still live, right? You might just rack now to the foreground of that person digesting what that person just said and suddenly it becomes this really interesting point of view this really emotional close michael mann insider kind of frame where you really feel like oh the person said something walked out of the frame and now racking to that person in the foreground just suddenly brought you into an emotional thing that you didn't have so that shot's still alive i'm constantly like actors will be like Am I in this shot? And I go, I don't know. I just go, always act. That's my perspective. I might hand to you. And they're like, what? Really? And I'm like, I have no idea. I'm just saying 
keep it live. This is my philosophy, by the way. You need the director to be on board. But if it was up to me, I love just saying like we shoot the we shoot every take, top to bottom, the whole scene, and we, yeah, exactly as Sarah said, like a documentary approach. But but like I like that style. Now, do I also love the Matrix where it's like shot like a storyboard? Of course I do. It's just not my style because there's not really as much discovery in the matrix there's just perfection of execution of like a very visually like uh precise film right i love the discovery and you only get the discovery by like diverging from the plan a little bit right you did uh, that in joker you kept rolling as I always did. every take if it's a master we run it from the top to bottom if it's an ecu we run it from the top to bottom even on a film always wow but that's awesome that's what i say that uniquely because you know i've done seven films with todd phillips so over the 15 years those seven films have represented a large uh time of my filmmaking life and that's how we do it but and listen black adam is also very piecemeal right but even in that i, tr I it, it's my if i had my druthers i'm like let's do the whole thing right now that, that ultimately you 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 can't do this without the director also being on board right the director might just simply go i just need it for this moment and that's it you know in my negotiations i try to convince them can we just run the whole thing but if the actor is not on board you're not going to get oh, that no. right so yeah. everybody has to be on board with this philosophy but but for me some of my favorite moments in every sort of thing is is like those moments that weren't intended to be for that right and i can show you examples of that in joker um because they happen all the time and sometimes they happen in ways that i'm like we're not going to use that and todd's like oh no, no no we'll never use that and then we do and then i go all right it's his choice like this shot here right this little master here it's a it's a set right and joaquin's in the other room and he's making food for his mom and the TV's on and they're about to watch Thomas Wayne say something about the killers on, uh, you know, the, the, the Wall Street guys that, that were murdered, right? And on I'm on a little butt dolly. Joined by Thomas Ooh. Wayne. Hey, look, Thomas Wayne's on so, right. Yes, mother. Thanks for having me on, Trevor. You're asking him about so those horrible I think it happens here right? if it goes long enough. Because you're going to see that little bobble here oh, yeah. is because I'm adjusting for the next shot and Todd's like, I'm, I'll make the adjustment because we're never going to use him because I didn't pan to him leaving the thing. I was like, well, he leaves and then he re-enters. We'll probably never use that. But Todd used it anyway. I tried to stabilize it in the DI. The stabilization was amazing. And Todd was like, why did you stabilize it? I like the little bumpiness of it all. So that stayed. But in a scene like this, this shot here which i don't know if it'll show it because sometimes it's in the dailies and sometimes it's in the cut Her family. You hear that? I told you family. this shot here is a and b cameras and it's mostly meant for the mom but in the longer lens shot which is over him to the mom i just pan over to get this close up because it was mostly intended to cover the mom's lines over him but that little close-up of him you know in silhouette is is like one of my favorite shots in the movie and again even the philosophy of lighting right like it's all a master right so i'm trying to make the master look good which i'm trying to find a shot that might show that i guess it's this this would be the master right and he doesn't sit in this shot so you can't really see it but when he does sit into this shot i'm doing it so that every single piece of coverage in here there's no lighting changes right so i'm literally hiding a light out this window here on the left to edge light her i'm skipping something off the floor and even this little light that's hitting this pillow i'm skipping from another place to help her wrap the light on her and then I'm, I'm, I'm the other window over here. I'm putting a little light from there to hit Joaquin when he sits down. But if I was coming around and just creating like relighting for every single shot, I'd probably change a bunch of things. But even this shot here is part of a, is just 
a continuation of the master lighting. Every shot in this, there's not a single lighting change that happens between every piece of coverage here. This is the right? best lesson, I think, for students, because sure. if the master shot works, we always say everything else will, you can tweak them and cheat them. But to get the master shot work is really difficult sometimes. And it's amazing yeah. that you, what you said, basically. Well, and what, what Rebel Film said with like helps the consistency, what I learned was, let's say I like the master, and then I come into like a close up of Joaquin watching the TV. Yeah, of course I could clean that up. I could bring in a light mat. I could bring in an eight by eight. I could create a book light. I could make it Roger Deakins beautiful. It'd be amazing. But then now when I go to the mom, I kind of have to do the same thing for her, right? And then when I go to the next shot, I kind of have to, it's like once you do it, it's like you're doing it for every single shot because, and that idea of consistency, it's like, I know that basically, I go, well, how many shots do we need to get the master right? Sometimes we'll spend a lot of time. It's not because we're trying to make the master perfect for some shot. It's we're trying to make the scene work, right? So we might spend like longer than you think on a master. And some people would be like, we're not using this shot. Move on. And it's like, no, no, the philosophy, and this is you know obviously a lot because it's Todd, is to understand the scene and the, and the structure of it. Because then once we get the master, and this just came out of like a philosophy to like make sure nobody left the set, I would sit there while we were shooting the master and going, it, when the minute Todd said, yeah, let's move on, I just go, change these two lenses, and I go, A camera, we're going here, B camera, we're going here, and we could be shooting in five minutes because I'm not changing anything. And then the rhythm of the set is just great, right? And then sometimes I'll be like, you know what? My B camera shot has already served its purpose. I'm going to move. I'm going to change the lens and move again. So suddenly it's like because Todd is like focusing on A camera and I have a chance with B camera to find something brand new, maybe something in a more adventurous, something that maybe isn't something you'd live in the whole take, but it might be a little moment. Or I go, God, he's doing something interesting with his hands. If I go now to a 150, I could go from an ECU down to his hands. And I know that it's not like I'm shooting an insert. I just know that's now potentially something they can use in the edit, you know? And so it allows like a bunch of coverage, right? Lots and lots of coverage. So the editor has all kinds of options. Todd has all kinds of options. But the actors never get out of rhythm. And the, the time between setups is really, really, really fast. It's great, Larry. I, I find it one keyword that it's a mystery i want to come to a mystery of your mind how you how you find the uh this mystery of movement the movement of camera that is related to the tempo to the rhythm and it makes the you know it's make it's bring the soul to the to the fix. yeah can you talk I about mean, the opening of Joker? Because you had one take, but in the edit they cut it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, but that movement that was amazing. Shot wraps, yeah, that that opening shot wraps all the way around and could have been a. a we did masters all the time. Um, it's I want to see because, that shot. Well, it, what amazing. I've learned, and this is like just the nature of the beast, right? Which is, um, sorry, I'm just going to shut this thing because it's in front of my thing. Is, is we will design things to work for the whole master if we're moving the camera right and if it's handheld you're obviously going to be somewhat limited in moving it but you have still obviously some freedom but it's a different kind of freedom a shot like this you know the opening shot of the of the film um yeah this probably starts a little late let me see actually maybe i can use it from here um yeah all the way around digitally removed but it basically goes all the way to the to the window and that way this camera could wrap all the way around into like a really beautiful like you know a beautiful like close-up that worked for the whole take once we did this and we probably did it six times and I think within the cut, you can see this is a B camera shot, but the shot that it wraps around into is this shot. This is actually the end of that opening dolly shot is this frame 
Um, so it literally works the whole way, but then we would just go, okay, now let's get a side angle shot and redo this, this frontal shot at the same time because we don't need the whole push in. And then it becomes edited as needed, you know? Um, but I remember I was doing an interview with, with, um, with, uh, craziness happening here, Brooklyn, people yelling outside my streets. Um, is I was doing an interview with like Gareth Edwards and, 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 uh, and the guys from the creator. And I think it's very similar. Like Gareth created an entire strategy so he could operate every shot. And, um, and they, so every shot you imagine ran for five or six minutes or whatever it took. But you would think, oh, when you watch the creator, it's all going to be these long sort of like masters. No, they're just a way for like you to get a lot of coverage within that sort of idea, right? And so very similarly, when I sort of approach when we're moving the camera and, and interestingly, like a shot, like when he's in the hospital with his mom and he, um, he sees himself on Murray Franklin, you know, where they play his, his comedy, his like little comedy bit. This is basically the B camera, right? This angle here, which is, which is, uh, the camera I was on. So I've laid out a bunch of dolly of like, of, of, um, of uh, dance floor so this shot which is over him is being shot at the same time as my master from is from the master from the side hey, one more, one more. and you can see i'm just kind of keeping it moving because i'm also on my way in and around to get to this frame so the other camera is moving out of the way so we're sort of dancing around each other to sort of create coverage because my camera i know i can get frontal on him and the camera behind him can step out of the way and get it over. So we're kind of dancing with each other to create like a two camera setup that actually provides the coverage for all of this stuff. And they're actually, they're all connected into masters for each other. Um, even though they, in the edit, they're, they look like lots of separate pieces of coverage. Like this little side angle shot, if you watch the dailies of it, plays the entire scene. Every shot within here plays the entire scene. Um, and sometimes they're sort of wonderful on their own, but I also recognize that like, that's not Todd's philosophy. That's not his editing style to sort of, you know, use a lot of wonders in that way. But we create a ton of wonders basically every single time. Now that you're showing this, how much of these pictures, just this scene that we are looking at is color graded or how much of it is actually the lighting on the set? Well, it's, because it's the LUT, this is all, this is very close to the dailies, you know? The only thing we're doing in the final DI is just sweetening it and making sort of shot by shot match a little bit better because sometimes the lenses are a little bit different and, you know, and we're just cleaning it up. But, but no, this is what the dailies look like. And it's all done with the lighting, you know, the, that color palette is done either obviously with some green that we added to the fluorescence and that sodium vapor coming through the window and, and the TV light, you know, the TV light was often the only time we would use like a little light, like very, very light LEDs just on something we could literally Velcro to the front of the TV so that, and then they would just cut that out and replace it. So if I put it in a master, sometimes you would see, you know, just literally the LED on there because that allowed me functionally to make it a practical in the scene that would help light, light his face. It's very Larry. unique color, very unique color. Yeah, it's great. I have a question. Larry, do you have a camera A and B? Yes. Have you think about your mind that how many percent you are concentrated on A or B or how you dance between these two? Well, I dance between those two because I'm on B camera. Right, and the reason I'm on B camera and not A camera is because I like to A camera, right? And so I'll set up the A camera usually as the master, and then I jump in and B camera really truly at the last minute, right? I might know if it's Dolly, I'll put them on dance floor. I have a little remote head, right? A Talon head, which is just a very basic remote head. And the reason I'll do it remotely is so that I can sit at the DIT and watch both cameras, 
right? And so I'll, uh, and that allows me, and then I have these headsets, so I can literally talk to, to the other camera during the take if I need to, and talk to the dolly grip to like literally whisper the camera move to them in real time, right? Like we don't work out marks, we don't work out timing, we literally just talk during the take um, when it's in this sort of dolly remote head thing. If it's handheld, I'm inside there and then that is what it is. But if it's like a moving camera and that kind of philosophy, basically, and, and because I'm concentrating on A camera, I don't I'm not really thinking about what I'm gonna do in B camera. And truly what I'm really trying to do is let go of everything and disappear into the scene like really truly sometimes my operator I mean, my camera assistant or the dolly grip will be like well what are we trying to do or where are we going to go where do you want to be and i'm like honestly i don't have any idea i truly and i don't say it like as a joke i say it like i don't actually know i'm going to try to just completely like be present and stay within the scene watch the actors and let the let it's almost like and then just I'll use my words to communicate where we want to go, but I just try to disappear into the scene so that it feels um, like I'm being controlled by the by the scene and the actors on where to go, as opposed to me having some pre pre. That's why I don't even like rehearsals. I don't want to yeah. know what the actors are going to do. I really don't want to. I don't like to block a rehearsal. I might want to understand somewhat where they're going to be, but if I can do it right and light this space then I actually don't give a crap. And if, if we run a first take or two takes and and they like literally are standing in the darkest corner of the room and I wanna help it out, I might just quickly make an adjustment in between takes. But maybe that was wonderful and it was in a way that if, if I knew that in advance, I might light that corner. But instead they went to that corner and I actually love it even more. So I actually like not knowing and I like that. And that's, that's so the, the reason I'm able to sort of shoot the two cameras in that way is because I'm in full control of the second camera. If I tried to communicate that to an operator, it would be really hard because I actually don't have the answers to tell them. I'd have to find someone who had the exact same philosophy as me as an operator, which was just like intuitively just do something that that feels like it's 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 communicating what the audience needs to see. What you say? That ass was Tiffin satin filter used. No, the whole movie, and I I used was the uh, Mitchell B. I mean the, the Mitchell A. I'm sorry, Mitchell A. The, but the Mitchell series. It's just a Mitchell A. Most of the most of the movie. Can you explain what it is exactly for those? The Mitchell A. Yeah. It's like an old fashioned diffusion filter. It's not fancy. It's just like a little softening filter. It just took for me. It just takes the edge off of um, the digital. Mitchell A. Do you mind yeah. writing it down, or if somebody knows Mitchell yeah, like A? Yeah, like M I T C H E L L, and then they okay. have A B C D. You know that Got that it. that's the different um, densities or like you know like strengths or whatever. Because there are some filters. I don't know if you've used that the one that strikes the uh, lighting source. You know, makes a like a flare. Do you use those? I mean, like like lenses. There's so many options. I don't. There's too many. Um, I did see this like it's almost I used to use black promise a lot when I was shooting film so I like that I saw I tested a, a filter that's kind of like a black promise that I liked a lot that sort of bloomed the highlights in that same kind of way I was testing Fogal like uh, like women's stockings you know the French uh, which you know I guess it's Dior or something the Fogal and you can put them behind the lens and they bloom the, the sources in a really beautiful way but they're pretty strong and and this filter replicated that a little bit which was cool uh sarah i want to only ask a question this i think it's be uh we, we can open and you can read the chat the question of uh, uh, our friends uh larry i want to ask some things that i i think it's uh, so amazing to know about your mind when you move the camera uh, um, your connection uh, with the sound and the music how you feel it before i don't think i i don't talk about uh, something written for you i don't uh, talk about some formula that come to your uh, hand that 
okay, here is music, here is sound, or you, uh, I want to know eternal uh, sound when you move the camera. I mean, I worked with Cameron Crowe once, just like briefly, because I came in to just finish up a movie that he was doing. And he would play music on the set in a way that I've never seen anyone do before. And I, I loved it. But he would literally, like a DJ, if let's say there was like three lines of dialogue and we wanted to like, and, and there was silence, he would play music. We'd begin the camera move, which was amazing because you could really feel like the pace of it based on the music. And then he would drop the music out and then the actors would say their lines. And if the actors had like a long pause, he'd pipe, he'd like literally mix the music back up and then he'd drop it out so they could continue their lines. And it was like live composing or live, you know, scoring. And I thought that was amazing. And obviously like Todd, because he had a lot of Hilder's score in the movie and we'd, we'd done that even on the new one, is if there's if there's a scene that's not really based on on dialogue we would play that music out or certainly play it through our headphones so it could be obviously it wouldn't disrupt the 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 sound you know the actual like audio track for the acting but that was super helpful you know to have that sense of the score or a sense of the music underneath you for camera movement but often it's like there's a certain slow rhythm of the camera in Joker. The biggest influence, quite frankly, to that was um, Killing of a Sacred Deer, the Yorgos movie. You know, I'll show you here. Killing of a Sacred Deer has this like weird tension filled camera movement. And I don't know where like, I'm trying to figure out like a shot specifically, but you know, obviously we see even in poor things. I don't know if this shot moves, but I'll just try it. Now we have to get him one so he can practice at home. I just have. But this to movie was actually quite influential to me for Joker. I'm on the phone all day. Our daughter started menstruating last week. Yeah, I don't know. Right. Yes, she was a little. Scared, I have to find like a shot that has this like kind of really slow. Because somebody like, asked lyrical, you. like lyrical camera, you know. Um, they asked, like, how can you act so fast in the moment, considering the time and, you know, mistakes on the set, and time on the set is uh, limited. Somebody asked that, Iliana. I don't know. I just, it was, it's been born out of this desire to work quickly, you know, and also just, uh, yeah, it's so interesting because even as you ask it, it's like with every new person you work with, you're like hoping that you guys will sort of find your way into a, something that allows for this kind of level of spontaneity and sort of like, because the, the quickness comes out of, it, 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 nothing happens in a vacuum, right? So like if a lot of what I'm describing obviously comes from working with Todd, right? Because together we've kind of developed this philosophy, right? So but i've worked with others in the same way but but it, it it it's never always exactly this but but the speed is because while i'm shooting a scene or while i'm like watching a master i'm just trying to think ahead so i'm never i'm like i i'm i'm thinking through basically what i'll do is let's say we do block it or let's say they they have a very simple blocking but it's not like with camera or anything it's not it's just like, let's see what the actors want to do. Hopefully, in the best case scenario, I've lit the set already, or I've like, you know, put some light into the set so I can at least see how it spills in, you know, from outside in the, or through the windows, the practicals are on, all that kind of stuff. And basically, I spend that time when the actors are talking about the scene, just watching it from a couple places to see where it looks good and to see where and then that becomes like i sketch out often on the back of the sides or whatever a little overhead and i just make a quick little plan of every shot that i think will complete the scene and then i just it, i'm constantly so it, i'm literally just thinking this is seven shots that can complete the scene and these are two or three special things that i'll try to fit in if i have the ability to and so i'm just like speed is really important and and it's just i don't know maybe it's just born out of experience um and other things but and but a good I also, 
I just like the set to move quickly if I can, you know. Thank you. Uh, Goss is asking, what is the best lighting for Lawrence Sher? I think you're out It's there. when the production design does it all. That's truly, like to me, the best lighting is basically that between the windows, the practicals, and any design, that that is everything we need. Then I'm like the happiest. Because then it does this thing that I want to do, which is to basically light the spaces and not the faces, and then also work really efficiently and really quickly through coverage to like exploit the best performances from the actors, you know? Natural thing that when there's music, it allows for a camera movement, right? In the same way as when there's less, you know, dialogue, there allows for opportunities for some of that. So some of it just comes out of the nature of the scene and the and the air that's in there to allow for like camera movement, allow for for more of a character study because you're not just trying to deliver lines of dialogue that needs to be digested for the audience. And you don't want to suddenly just be dis circling the actors and being a distraction to the dialogue. Sometimes you just need to stay still to communicate certain things, you know? I mean, look at the end of the movie with Murray Franklin. There's movement, but it's usually almost exclusively devoted to the wides. And then the movement that comes later, which is when he's really firing off at him before like the 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 ending of that then we start to move the camera a little bit more you know but at that time he has a long scene of him sitting there on the couch with him and it's you know all of these things were meant to replicate you know this stuff we were shooting you know every one of these little cameras here on the floor and there are four of them all have little mini lfs and, or mini mini like or, original minis in them that are basically shooting the TV footage and all the sort of what is the the audience's view of this. They're all shooting every single take live. So we're always rolling those four cameras. And then we have three cameras that are on the outside and they're every other take, they're moving to a new position to just cover these kind of shots, you know, over the TV and all that. So this is C camera and at the same time as C camera shooting, this is A, this is B camera, my camera, which is on a techno crane. And it just allows me to constantly change up. And then, you know, at the same time as my camera is this camera, or this was on another crane. And we're just trying to get all the wide shots. But then obviously, once we get into this sort of stuff here, when he's like really speaking to him, you finished? You know, these I mean, so much so are pity, Arthur moving like in slowly killing those young men but these Not two shots it's cross cut these, these are shot these are shot uh um simultaneously a and b cameras cross cutting so this is oh, cross -cut. yeah, this is b camera this is the camera i'm on here wild. and i'm moving in slowly on the techno crane and the a camera which is the reverse of it which is this shot of de niro this shot so this a camera is just You're barely right. we're barely Maybe. basically framing each other out Oh yeah, how am I? But we're cross shooting it. Can I ask a question, Larry? Yeah. Uh, this is my, not my question. I read uh, this is a question of the friend that asked, "What's the most difficult scene in Joker for you?" You know, this Murray Franklin stuff was tough because it was really long, and every single take, we. And it, partly it was difficult, not difficult shooting wise. It was difficult because it's 10 pages. And so we knew we wanted a lot of coverage. And so when, when do we find that moment that is like capturing the best? Like we, we, I think we discovered during the making of this scene, we always knew that this, this piece of coverage here, right? This close up that ends up becoming like the end of the scene, right? was going to be something that we really were going to be happy with, right? But we we didn't shoot it until very late in the coverage. And I remember when we did, Todd and I were like, we probably should have shot this earlier. because. But if we had shot it earlier, we may not have shot all the other coverage, right? Because it was, it was so powerful. But in the end, it's actually good because he only uses it at the end. And it was hard on, on De Niro. 
to do 10 pages every single take because the, even these takes we would start with joaquin coming out of the curtains and we'd go all the way until he's just about to shoot him and it was maddening because you're like well wait a second we're just doing a big high wide shot from the corner but because of our philosophy joaquin loved it because he's like inexhaustible in that way but for de niro and for other actors it's exhausting to do 10 pages like 50 times right and so this was and we had like could be the nature of working off a crane wasn't because it was more of a functional tool right in order for me to get a big wide shot over the crowd here it was like well we had space let's put a crane here and then the other two two other cameras were on dollies it wasn't because we were doing big sweeping moves we were literally using it just to be able to move more efficiently and when you say what was difficult it was a technical problem the libra head we had just kept spazzing out in the middle for lack of a better word like during the take and so i kept having technical problems and 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 todd was getting aggravated so it was more like when you used to say what was difficult it wasn't the shooting of it or the lighting of it it was because we were it was like a long scene with lots of coverage and 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 any of those long scenes with lots of coverage can be very exhausting you know yeah. whereas a scene of him playing with the gun in his apartment or writing notes in his journal, those are really quite easy, you know? Um, or some of the other scenes, they weren't really difficult, you know? The, the One of the hard scenes for me was mostly because it was filler and we were maybe not gonna shoot it because it was the end of a work week and we were really tired and Joaquin had hurt his foot had it hurt his leg like on the second day of shooting and was like basically suffering through this pain the whole time and this little inner like this little connective tissue that we needed which were basically these shots right so this shot here which is him running up the stairs at a at a subway stop you know near wall street right so starting right here on the next cut here this was just one shot we did in this actual practical location, right? And then this shot here. I love it. I love this right? shot. And then this shot here, which is from a grip tricks, right? And then and then the end of this shot is basically there's really there's three pieces of coverage. There's this shot, which we shot first, right? Which is him coming around the corner and run because basically we just needed to get him from the subway platform into that into the bathroom right and Sarah, this is the shot Sarah. right so he turns the corner here and then this is like a practical bathroom and then now we're on stage right okay so that's it it's it's basically um that setup and two more so three setups right and probably maybe it was more than that and oh four setups that night because they, we also had this shot here going up the stairs anyway and todd and joaquin were basically it was just very tiring and todd was like do we even need this and i was really looking forward to it because i just had this idea of that shadow thing and i just was like i think this is like an energy shot that the audience needs and also just like to see the desperation of him running away from the scene of a crime and so todd was like yeah but I, we really i'm just do we have to do this and i was like todd we can shoot every single thing we need for the night it was a night of shooting i said i will do it all before lunch i promise we'll be done in four hours i absolutely promise you and and he's like that's fine if you can do it in four hours we can shoot it but anything longer i'm going home and and joaquin was hurting so it was like he it was like you can't make joaquin run very hard and i remember because we had that grip tricks and Joaquin could barely walk, not barely walk, but he was definitely like hurting the whole movie. But this is also very classic Joaquin is we were at a grip tricks and we followed him. Right. So that shot that the shadow, you know, this shot here, the shadow shot is on a grip tricks. Right. And we have a, a small arm and and we're basically doing it. You know, every shot still two cameras. Right. So that same thing. Sorry, let me just find that shot again. I lost it. Um, just to take you through the coverage is so this shot here is um is the second to last shot we did or the yeah because so we did this 
So this is on the grip tricks. It's like maybe eight, like 10 or 12 feet high following him. And then we follow him on a longer lens at the exact same time on the A camera, basically like handheld on like a hundred mil. And then this shot is, you know, on the 24 or 28 mil, like following him. And then this leading shot is two cameras, low angle on the stabilized head. And then the closer shot of him running, which I'm not even sure is in here anymore, is is at the same time. And then, and then those other pieces of coverage. But anyway, is when we were following Joaquin, or no, when we were leading Joaquin, I said to him, well, you don't have to run as fast because we're leading you. So you can just set the pace based on your running. And of course he just took off and ran out of the shot. So then we were like, okay, we have to go as fast as we could. And we realized the fastest we could drive the grip tricks, he was gonna run. And so he's running with all, and that's obviously, he put whatever pain aside to like make it great. Uh, but he really took off running in both these shots. And I think we did two takes and that was it. And, and you know, we turned, so we, we had to flip around and shoot both sides of the coverage and all this kind of stuff in this night exterior in a decently short time, but it was fine because it was enough time to like, you know, get it. And the hardest shot here was just- The shadow. Trying. Yeah, somebody it's asked how did you get it. Well, yeah, it's just like, it was an idea I had, but I knew that if we struggled with it, Todd would just say, just don't worry about it. Like, it's not worth it. And so I had to keep running back to the front of the camera and just, changing the angle of that like naked red head you know it's like a 2k you know open face light with a sharp beam to create that single shadow and then trying to explain the timing with the camera and joaquin of like can you run in front of that light before you enter the camera and i th think this was the second take and that was it and then once we got it, it was like okay good we can move on was it but your idea was challenging but, the shadow uh, was your idea or was it uh, in the script? No, no, no. It was just my idea. Yeah, I know. I told yeah. you, Sarah. I told you. This is my favorite and this is the idea of uh, Larry. Yeah. That's amazing. We have but, so but many here's the thing. But when I say it was my idea, it's really Todd's idea because, and this is like, Todd had talked to me like early on when we were like, had first sent me the script and he talked to me about like the movie is really about our shadow self and the fact that we have a dark side to ourself and we have a light side and 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 he said it in obviously a philosophical way about this sort of you know under undercurrent of what the movie's about right so I, like if you were explaining to the actor it's like there's a shadow side and 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 the movie is really about arthur fleck sort of embracing the shadow side of himself which is joker and and so when he said that to me, I remember writing him an email, Todd, in which I was like, I love this idea so much. And I made like a manifesto of ways we could show that visually in the movie, right? I was like, we're gonna front light him in the middle, in the beginning of the movie, and we're gonna slowly start to like introduce a more of a shadow side of himself later in the movie, right? And And, I wrote it in a way that was like very sort of, you know, in, in on paper it feels very overt and it almost feels like, like self-aware. It just felt like I think it scared the shit out of Todd. Like he didn't even. I think he responded by going, "That that might be a little much. Like don't do that." And I was like, "Yeah," but so I was like, "Okay, I can't make it overt, but there must be there there are ways, there are places in this movie where where subconsciously I can express this shadow side." that Joaquin is doing with the character and, and the story is doing with him becoming Joker, but maybe there's a way to do this with lighting too. So then, I, because he got kind of freaked out by the email, I just never told Todd about it, but I would try to light the things to express that idea. That's why like in this scene, in this scene uh, where, you know, he's with his mom sitting and watching TV, I think we showed it earlier, it was like this side pipe of idea was part of that, right? This is, he had just killed them. He's now in his house, but I wanted now like early days, he's got like the front blue light from the TV. He's with his mom, it's warm. I tried not to do that early, but I wanted to express that later and later in subconscious ways 
that I didn't have to explain to Todd, but I felt like he had already explained it to me, and now I was just expressing his vision photographically. So I didn't tell him about the shadow thing, because then he might go, this is too self-conscious. But I sort of threw it in there and thought, as long as we could do it quickly, he might. And, and my philosophy was, if he hated the shadow, he would just cut to that shot later so he didn't have to use it. And that was me. I was like going, if you hate it, just don't cut it. You can cut around it. Because I felt like if I had to try to convince him that night, it would have he would have maybe just said, don't do it, you know. That's but I was glad, obviously, that it's in the movie, of course. I, um, I read some so many, questions, Sarah. Yeah, so many questions. So many of them uh, you replied already regarding the style and lighting and things you used. But one is from Kiara asking about the lensing. Uh, correct us if, you, uh, if you're wrong. You use different kind of lenses for Joker. Yeah. What were the parameters? Uh, do you think you have to have exact lenses or you let your team kind of, you know, have um, different lenses to choose from or taking advice from uh, them? If, is that a good way? That's a long question from Kiara about lensing the Joker. Yes. By the way, Donato just made a little note, which is exactly that, right? Donato just said, he said, like, um, uh, so shooting coverage is a way to get to, like, ex, you know, a, a discover new sort of ideas. That's exactly what it is, right? Which is, and particularly if you shoot a second camera, because the second camera could be adventurous. But doesn't, but can, you know, like what Todd would always say is he's like, do whatever the heck you want with it. I'm only watching A camera. And then it was like, and my feeling was like, well, with B camera, I can give them something that if it feels too self-conscious or if it's it's too weird in the sort of angle, it's not, we're not basing the whole scene on that coverage. But then obviously it gives them options in the edit to discover some things that then ultimately become the style of the movie because Obviously, there's a lot of B camera shots in the movie, um, but I think it was a way for us to explore new ideas in a less scary way, right? Um, but nonetheless, but yeah. So the lensing, just like with um, with the lighting, often it's functional decisions. Like you know, that like I truly going, I need large format that can cover the RA65 across the 185 right so some of it's like okay where are the full frame lenses right and then the dna's i like the 28 and the 80 and the 110 but they were a little bit breathing so i didn't want to have a whole set of dna's right and the dna is covered so then it was like to my camera team can you find me lenses that are of the era right so like basically would have existed in the 70s and 80s so they're older glass they didn't have to be perfect. In fact, I'd rather they not be perfect, but they needed to be close focus, which was really critical and fairly quick because I knew I was shooting with practical lighting. And so sometimes I'd have a 50 mil lens that was a 1.5, but then I'd also have a better 50 mil lens that was like better quality that was a 2.8. So if I needed the quality, I'd shoot with the 2.8 one. The 1.5 was if I was outside and I just needed the exposure. There, so it's truly like that, exactly. It's like a Frankenstein lens package of Canon. You know, there's Zeiss lenses, there's Nikors in there, there's the DNAs, there's Signature Primes, there's, you know, there's a, it's really truly because it, it was like filling out a set that provided, um, w you know, specific needs, right? Like we don't use super wide lenses a lot, but if I needed a 21, I needed something that would cover, right? So maybe that's a master build, you know, back then they didn't exist, but now they do. But like, oh, there's a 21 that covers the full spectrum, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, even in choosing lenses for this new movie, the, the criteria is sort of similar, right? It's like, I want it to not be super sharp. I want it to be older, to have character. Um, but it also has to be like for me, right? Close focus is such an important thing simply because sometimes you just want to keep pressing in and not have that limitation and not put a diopter in, which is a disaster for the focus pullers and just become so specific. So it's like that close focus and that sort of sometimes weight uh, and speed become really important, you know? 
Um, now that you mentioned that uh, Joker 2, Cassidy, I think, asked earlier, can you tell us a little bit about how you shot the Supreme Court scene in Joker 2? And oh, is it a prequel? I don't know. It, or, and is it a prequel <laughs> or sequel? I don't know about Joker I can't tell you anything about Joker 2. You guys will find out soon enough. I get in trouble for saying Tell us exactly. Tell us something. <laughs> the hardest thing about shooting outside at the end of Joker, and obviously there's like, you know, there's paparazzi footage of it, is just anytime you have a short window where you're shooting exteriors, you're just a, at a mercy for, for weather. And we got lucky, but we had that, we had one day in the middle in which like rain came in and then and sometimes you just don't even on a big movie you don't have the ability to come particularly like a, a big location like that extras it also has to be on a weekend you can't just come back and so trying to sort of suffer through and and in real time right because you see the weather coming you make a plan you then have to sort of like work really closely with your ad and their department to like find the best plan that sacrifices the least. So in that case, it's like, oh, these four scenes we could do on the rainy day because editorially they're not connected to coverage in a way that like it won't feel like a continuity error, but we have to make sure we get the piece that is like continuous tomorrow or else we're stuck. So it's like a little bit of then it goes into the logistics of movie making, which I like. So I'm always into like, scheduling and all the rest of it you know I, I i like that part of the job so i think cassidy was in that scene while you were shooting it that's why she knows about it yeah of <laughs> course but so she knows but we i can't tell people yeah she should tell us later cassidy <laughs> um uh, as time is like uh, an hour and a half through it um regarding shot deck i just want to round up yeah, things yeah. and if you want to mention anything from what I can see, since 2019, you know, one of the side uh, products of Shot Deck is all this conversation we have now. Before that, I don't know if, if it was a thing in America too, there was something like a photo.net that we were collecting all these artistic photos and I was oh, like, yeah. I have 200 photos saved, 100 black and white. Like each one of us had a thing that, how many photos do you have in your mood board and collection? <laughs> And then when uh, 2019, you introduced Shot Deck, we, we had a discussion with some of the DPs that are actually, maybe some of them are here, that were like, you know, how many can they collect? There are so many movies, like one million, two million. It's not going to be enough. But even after a couple of movies that you put on, our eyes were so, like, our eyes were happy. Like, it's kind of a food to the eye that we started this conversation, like, look at this, how they did it. And now it's not only photos. So this is the new update. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's not only photos, like one million and two hundred, as you said. It's also video clips. Well, and the music video topic. side. When you, what you're seeing here, like when I play those clips, there, that's like that's my hidden future uh, version of Shot Deck. I just show it there because it's an easy way to show those clips. But yeah, that's a that's a future version but yeah exactly some of the because the video clips exist on the on the music video side but not all movies like the way you're seeing like my uh my uh ad administration version of shot deck <laughs> but that is a plan it's just a question of when but yes yes that is the goal yes of course is the yeah because of course it's something needed as well for sure um and um now we have this color palette which is amazing yeah. for production designers right well i think it's just it was something very needed because you know we used to just have you know we used to have just this these colors here right like what's listed on the left hand side here and it was like you know done in that kind of fashion but the idea that now you can pick a color you know you can sort of open up the color picker and look for something that's in this tonality and then pick the distance from the color. So this RGB color here, you can pick the distance from it. So you can be very precise, which will show a lot less, you know, results, or you can expand the color to be near that color, but not everything. And this is obviously just searching Joker, but we can just search the whole site at large. This for is this new. Kind of color. I haven't and seen then this. you can do the proportion of the shot. So you can say, well, how much of this color do I want in the shot? Wow. Right. So you can expand it, 
you know, and, and you'll get less results, of course, but the proportion of that color in the shot will start to grow if you change this, right? And so that way, if you're looking for something very specific, you know, you can start to get, um, you know, like more of this color in the shot. This is, it, 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 you know, you'll see it more in something very specific like this. Wow. Right? And so the more proportion you add, the less shots, but now it's it's a big part of the shot as opposed to if you lessen this proportion, it might just be some small thing like the left-hand side of this guy's face in the shot here, you know? Proportion of the shot. And what's their Roscoe colors? Somebody Roscoe colors is we just took, we had a collaboration with Roscoe where you can pick some of their actual gels, right? And then look for colors that are sort of in that gel. So scarlet. And that way, if you're like, oh, I want, I want to light this like scarlet, or like I want to light this shot like this, and you go and get this scarlet Roscoe gel to match that color. So this is a collaboration we did with Roscoe. And if you click on any of these photos, it shows similar photos, which is well, that's awesome. right. So here, this shot here, blinding light, you'll see similar shots underneath here, and those similar shots are based on. You know, this is sort of like a thermal vision thing. So this will show other kinds of things that look weird, like thermal vision, you know. But you also could actually also just look for thermal imaging and find shots that are just thermal imaging. Like zone of interest, which I don't think we have yet, but we'll have soon. And that zone, that zone, zone of interest stuff was awesome. That was some cool stuff in that movie. Haven't seen that. It's something to watch. Um, prediction for best picture it's going to be a runaway oppenheimer year it's going to be boring i wish yeah. it was i wish uh i wish there was more um more of a fight this year i think i think oppenheimer is going to win 10 10 oscars and i think the only surprise is i think the biggest surprise race i think i think downey's going to win i think emma stone and lily Definitely. gladstone that's a tight race and there's a chance that Giamatti wins for holdovers, which could be cool. I would Joker love it. Next Honestly, year. Casey, Cassidy, I would love if Barbie won. I don't think it will. Yeah. I haven't voted yet, so we'll see. Uh, My um, favorite movie of the year, Poor Things. I love it. You know, last week it was BSC Award, British Society of Cinematographers. I saw and that. There, yeah, Poor Thing won for I the saw. best. Uh, cinematography yes which i was so happy about yeah robbie is amazing yeah yeah, yeah. i, I love that movie and i thought robbie's work was amazing and i think the timing of this session is amazing so we know what is the bsc award winner and next week is bsc expo which we really miss you larry it would have been amazing because everyone's know, gonna be so. there so whoever is joining and uh, next week we have uh like the big uh exhibition of all cinematographers um kit and you know, rigs and grips and lenses and all the companies are involved. So this is interim time to have a session with you talking about shot deck because I realize so many of our friends from other countries, uh, so many know about it, even in Iran, but so many didn't know or didn't know the extent of it. They knew about the concept, but not all these little bits and pieces of color palette. These are all yeah, these maybe, yeah. Maybe we have to do a better job presenting. I'll say one thing that I don't think even people that are using shot tech, and I really suggest this as a major thing, which is a lot of people, because of course you're going to build your decks in a variance of ways, right? You're going to build them, you know, maybe in Lightroom or wherever you do. And so people will like look at a shot like this, they'll grab it, and then they'll just take the full size shot and sort of, you know, drag it into their onto their desktop or into a folder. But I really, and I can't say this enough, build decks. Because the benefit of building a deck is any of these decks, you know, like, so if I took that shot here, browse shots, right? And I wanted to add this shot and I just hit this little thing here and I create a new deck, right? And I say, you know, Sarah's deck or whatever, right? And then I add this shot to the deck, right? And then you can do this little quick add thing, right? So now this is your quick add deck. And then I just go through here and I go, oh, I want this shot for the Sarah deck. And, you know, down here I could quick add this one and I could quick add this one. And so you're adding all these shots to the deck. The benefit now is you can still 
take this Sarah deck, right? You can reorganize where they are in the deck, whatever it is. You can move them around, right? But also you just export the entire file as full size JPEGs, just like you were dragging them to your thing. But the benefit is, so you've still had the benefit of now being able to put them in a deck in another format, but you, you now have them here in case you are like wanted to send this to somebody or share it with your team, right? You share it with somebody else on shot deck. So I share it, I share, you know, I, I send it to, to me. Let's say she wanted to send it to me so I can share that deck with me and then they can edit that deck. They can add notes to it, you know, here, they can add a little note, love this or whatever it is. Right. But the benefit of keeping it in a deck is if you were looking at it later and you're like, where's this from? Oh, decision to leave. You now are still in the ecosystem of shot deck to now go to decision and leave and see more shots. Once it leaves your leave shot tech and goes onto your desktop, all it is is just an image, right? It has no more utility. And so build as many decks as you absolutely need and, and use the decks as like your holding place for all these, all these things because you can, as you can see, just for me, like I never, I archive my decks when they get too busy on my folder, I'll put them down here into archive. Sometimes I'll put them in trash if I know I need them, but I can always go back and find them, you know, or create just decks that live forever on here uh, for just inspiration. And so we need to do a better job communicating that to our users, which is to use decks. Is like it's you're you thing. still get all the value out of the shot by just exporting it out of your deck. But if it stays on shot deck in the decks, it just has so many so much more value, you know. TC, uh, who is an amazing uh, gaffer, I adore him. He asked that. Um, do you condense your decks down for each each of your heads of departments, like gaffers, camera operators, production designers? I share them with all of them. So I'll share that deck with the director, the production designer, or whatever, but then I'll share specific decks. And sometimes I'll export them and put them into like my Bible or I'll put them into like an email and, and say, you know, for this scene, here are some images that I want to see. But, you know, particularly with like the app, having them in a digital file is so much easier because then you just go on the app and on set go oh yeah that's the shot we're trying to reference or that's like the inspiration what i'm looking for if i'm communicating with my gaffer or something like that so one deck for all and everybody's on the same page yeah no i i create all those sub decks so i'll create a master deck of the movie but i'll have all those sub decks and if you create if you share that master deck it asks do you want to do, share all the the sub decks and yeah then it just shares everything but yeah, so Matt asked philosophy on HMI tungsten LED. It's a great question, right? And I recently just did a really, really specific test just for this reason because I like, I really do like, genuinely like shooting digital. I, I still film still has digital beat in color rendition across a wide variation of spectrum. You can make every digital shot look like film in each individual setup. But if you did like a variance of like changing colors and changing like taller temperatures with one light, film will capture this spectrum better than digital. But if you just had like, oh, I'm trying to match this to what the film does, digital's, I would say 99.5% there. But I was really interested to think film camera, tungsten light, HMI light versus film camera, something LED replicating that tungsten light, something LED representing that, that daylight. And to see if in the actual color rendition, I could tell a difference in the color timing. And frankly, I was expecting to see a bigger difference. I did not see a big difference. I literally took a gem ball 3200 or gem ball at 2800 500 watt bulb dimmed down and i put it right next to a gem ball with like an led source inside exact same color temperature we even did like the x y coordinates to like match them and i did the exact same thing with daylight and i thought i'd see a bigger difference in the skin tones and other things because i was really wondering about that and um you know because on the first joker i had this philosophy of really using only lights that existed from that time period. And for that movie, it worked great. But there are some benefits to the LEDs that are like, you just can't deny them, right? Like, 
the color temperature, the dimming, the, the remote, uh, the DMX possibilities of it, all that kind of stuff. Some of it in the same way as I've talked about with lensing and other things, sometimes the practical application of filmmaking is really, it really matters. Like nothing is in a vacuum, right? And yes, you can adhere to these really constricted things out of like a, like the desire to be really organic and true to something. And that sometimes is great. But sometimes you're like, if this means I can change the color of that light or I can change the density of that light without having to put somebody on a ladder or take that light down from a condor and change it, that sometimes matters so much that you have to sort of use some of the technology that exists because otherwise you're, 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 you're going to go slower or you're going to cause more money or you're going to need more manpower and, or whatever that might be. And so, uh, I, I, it, it comes into play, you know, because even on this movie, which has some period aspects to it, uh, the new one that I'm doing, you know, I am going to try to use some old fashioned tungsten and HMI lights, but though I'll also mix in a, a, a LEDs. I think I just have to. Larry, um, um, one of the friend asked about your relationship with the uh, uh, colorist. Uh, yeah, super important. Yeah. I mean, my colorist, Jill, has been with me a long time, and we start every movie I do. She's one of the earliest calls I make. And when I start testing, because I really like testing, we start working on whatever the LUT that might become my sort of show LUT for that movie. And so, before shooting? Yes, like a month two months before shooting the, the minute I can get my hand, hands on anything to shoot. So if it's a makeup hair test or a wardrobe test, or we need to test fabric that all goes into like, let's start, or we'll start taking shots from shot deck and start saying, well, this feels like the look of the movie and, and what can I do to like sort of adjust LUTs that we've already used before. Um, and so, so yeah, she starts and then I usually have her, help color the first week of shooting and then the dailies colorist will work on the on the on, the, on it for the rest of the movie yeah it, mean, it means that uh, maybe you, you exchange many things that it brings some idea to be developed or some new idea that comes yeah it's just it's also just like any collaborator you know we have just a second hand and if i express something i'm looking for I just know that she can find a solution to it because again, I just want to cut if I'm shooting digitally, I just want to go into the movie with one thing that is that I can light to. I don't want to sort of guess because I don't like to color on set. I don't like to do any of that. I just like to light and shoot like as if I'm shooting a film camera. So that LUT, which also becomes the same look of the dailies becomes just essential to establishing the look of the movie. So it's like basically choosing my film stock or, 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 you know, a part of choosing lenses is just whatever that LUT is. And the LUTs are pretty straightforward. The main thing, they're all trying to replicate just the, the, the S curve of film. And the only difference is sometimes just where we put the, the white level and the black level and some tonality in there, whether it's a little bit of color in the, in the whites and blacks. Um, but they're subtleties, but they matter. Yeah. There, there is a so good many question, questions Sarah. about yeah. yeah i think it's too details uh, about color grading and you know the software you use i mean feel free how much you want to answer this I, use I know resolve. they're very broad i use resolve but that's also because for the longest time like the way resolve worked which was slightly different than luster or or um base light i just felt more comfortable talking with colorists when we were using resolve so that just became my default platform. And so I've used that for 20 years. Um, you know, so I don't use, yeah, but I know there's incredible work that can be done on the other systems too. So I think it's just, just personal preference. Um, also about the look that Alexa 35 and Ari textures give you, does that take the, uh, like free you from all the colorists or not? I don't do that. I, I've only recently, I, I haven't shot with the Aerie 35. I've tested it. Um, I liked it, but I'm such a large format fan that like full frame stuff that I probably won't shoot it on this. Um, 
I won't use those textures built in. I feel like that just isn't something I'm into. I think I'd, I'd, I do sometimes bake in little things like grain, but even that I like it to not be driven in because I still think that, like we need to give a little flexibility uh, in post. Um, I, you know, I've recently done like a very extensive test the Sony against the LF, and they were so they were really really close. So considering using the Sony, um, I think they they have some benefits that are really great. Um, the Rialto mode, the single stop NDs, the dual ISO, the 3200. There's some things in there that I th I'm really interested in. I related to these subjects, how you convert, how you um, you cannot forget 35 millimeter. Uh, in using the real cinema and you come to the digital. Of course. Listen, no. I, I still absolutely love it. Sometimes, again, the consideration goes to, like, the director and if they feel like, you know, uh, they like working. You know, think about it. most, almost, almost all films, and there's been a re real resurgence, right? If you look at it, the directors are really making the decision to shoot film versus the DPs, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, like that is usually the, the decision of the director nowadays, right? Because the directors are the ones that really, I think, are the ones that are demanding film on those projects, you know? Um, whether it's Adam McKay on Vice, Whereas, you know, Denis Villeneuve will be like, no, I like digital. I want to shoot, you know, my movies digitally. You know what I mean? It's like, or obviously Tarantino and Spielberg and those kind of people. So I still love film. Trust me, I've tested it three times in the last month against every sensor. So I know exactly what it provides. Um, and it's great. But what I will say is this. It's great. But I don't miss it as much as most people do. I shot 25 movies on film, and it's cool. But I don't miss it as much. I actually think there's there's like a lot of um, like real creativity that can be had since we since we gave some of this digital uh, photography a chance. So I'm probably on that spectrum. That I I, I often find the films that I feel like are being the most adventurous are often still shot digitally these days. So we except see. except for Euphoria, which is wild. So maybe maybe we can uh, wait for a film with Le that Larry uh, choose the thirty five yes. minutes. I would have thought. I don't think I'm shooting this new film on film, and I but I tested it so extensively, um, and you know. There's a textural and an organic quality to it that's amazing. And but there will be there'll be a film soon. I think I'll go back and shoot on film. Um, I've shot it recently too, but uh, it's interesting because I thought maybe on paper I would have shot this new one on film starting out, but now I feel pretty convinced we're not going to shoot it on film. Yeah. yeah. I think we have to slowly wrap up, but there are some people that have very burning questions that I think it's better that we open their mics. Shahram John, I can't unmute people. Can you unmute Sarah Thomas? Okay. And uh, she can ask her question, I think. Yeah, Thanks, I can. Sarah. Hey, how's everybody? Happy Lunar New Year, Seer of the Wood Dragon starting today. Thanks, Larry. This is awesome. Good to see you. Good to see you, Sarah. Good seeing you, Sarah. I really appreciate all your information and sharing. I feel like that, um, you know, I'm trying to get to that level that you're working at in studio environments. I'm doing indies. I have a big broadcast documentary background, reality TV. Uh, so I totally appreciate you um, sharing. Even at that level, you're still, you know, you're still doing the negotiating efficiently. You're mixing light sources. You're doing all the things that I'm doing. So it gives me a lot more confidence to know that, I don't necessarily have to, you know, step into a green screen world in a in a studio, you know, level and completely lose everything else that I've already learned, right? Um, so this is kind of exciting. I'm very intuitive, even when I operate. I love working with operators, but if I'm operating, I'm super. All that documentary intuitiveness 
letting the camera roll. Like I'm excited hearing you say all that. So, so thanks. Um, I don't know if I had a particular question, Sarah, but um, you asked me. We were we were talking about LUTs, for example, and looks, and I just sort of brought up the point. Um, I agree with you on bringing that colorist in, even if you have to work with a post-production supervisor on a series to bring those people in as soon as you can into that conversation. So you're all making cohesive decisions together so that as a DP, you're not burned in the back, you know, on the back end, nobody's pointing a finger at you and blaming you. Do you want to, can you have any more comments on that, Larry? Just well, kind of like, I mean, you know, I think I, I always, I feel like, I feel like I haven't run into, I've run into just small ways in which like, you know, there's a difference of opinion about something looking like something. I mean, but I'm sure that, that, you know, listen, it could also happen next and then I'll have a different level of experience. But I feel like everybody, everybody's on the same page which is to make something really good. And, and there's, whether you're even in commercials are a good example of where you constantly have to sort of adapt in real time to the reactions of the, the, the people that you're collaborating with, right? Like you'll get, a deck of a commercial that's very cinematic and has some darkness and then suddenly it's like when the agencies seeing it on the set they just want everything brighter and that's just like the nature of the beast right and on a movie i think there's a little more flexibility to define what that looks like um but uh but you know this idea that we yes i know there's a lot of anxiety and fear in the asc and other communities about us losing control over the look I know that's a genuine concern. I feel like you, if you create the look as you go, like I always look inward and I go, man, if the look didn't service the movie, yeah. then maybe there's a reason. I don't know. It's like, you, you, you know, I don't, I, 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 it's a, it's an interesting one. It's like, first of all, no, no DP is in control of anything. It's a, you're being paid by a studio to do this thing. You're not at, painter on a canvas and i think it's 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 just it's like you have to work well with others and so just the best yeah. way for you to protect your work is to just create good relationships with the people you're working with and then you know then you have a larger voice in defending the choice right but there's like yeah. i've i've gotten in arguments all the time i've gotten in arguments with todd who obviously i've worked with a lot about we got in fights we had an argue we literally had a screaming match once where todd's like the studio keeps calling they said it's too dark which i know they never <laughs> called so i knew he was lying and i said are you fucking kidding me the asc called me and they told me it's too bright so like here we can keep fighting about it like we we screamed at each other over the look of joker as we made it and obviously when it was all said and done it's like and and you hear this i mean like ridley scott had a terrible relationship with with um uh with what's his name uh you know Cronenweth on 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 you know on Blade Runner right one of the most iconic movies of all time David Fincher supposedly had a real hard relationship with with um Darius Kanji on Seven it's like also one of the most incredible looking movies of all time right so like I think as a as a cinematographer you try to find that balance where you you have to sort of say also you know like trust me in this and 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 you may not see it now but you will and know that also you're not making something that's the the thing whatever you're doing still needs to be uh still needs to work for the film you know yeah uh, thank you Mary. yeah for sure thank you i think cassidy and maybe after that we wrap it up yes let's uh you can open your Mike, yeah. Hi, Kelsey. can you hear me? Hi, yeah. can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, so I was wondering if you had any recommendations for books for cinematographers to read. That's a great question. There was this old book, and I can't remember what it was called, but it I I loved it so much. I mean, I brought it everywhere with me, right? I'm just gonna try to search for it because it like um it was it was it was old right i think it was called conversations with cinematographers but it had a yellow cover but i think this isn't what it looks like
but it, it I'm let me see if I can try to find it and I'll put it into a WhatsApp or something. It was like it wasn't this Master of Lights one. It was this one? But basically, the cinematographers that were in that book, I'll try to find it because you know. But it was great. All it was was it was like back with like cinematographers like Haskell Wexler and John Alonzo and and Caleb Deschanel and stuff. So it was it was. I think the conversations must have happened in the early 80s, right? And I think somebody tried to make like another one, you know, based on that. But this I remember just having a yellow cover. And I would bring that with me and it would sit in the bedside table next to me on every movie I did for like the first 15 movies. And it was so great because in it was just a bunch of Q&As, but often in there they would just have conversations about the DP who, you know, talking about how they screwed something up or how they got started or whatever it was. But I just felt it really comforting. Um, I don't know if it was this one. I, somebody sent me this thing, Reflections on Cinematography. But I'll try to see, look for that. But nonetheless, that book, if I could find it, was my favorite book on on uh, cinematography. Um, but the um, the other one is Final Cut, which is like a movie just about the sort of making of heaven's gate and that one is awesome uh what was the one you just sent me i can't remember what it was called look they're trying to push me valentine's day stuff if you can see that um anyway i'll try to find the name of it but but nonetheless yeah that book was uh that book i'll we'll try to find it was great and but final cut is an incredible book about the making of and like inside baseball movie industry stuff this is really great thank you one tiny question are you yeah. looking for camera pas i'm not on this film because i've already got it okay. filled up but thank you for asking sometimes thank you <laughs> there you go good to ask uh, in Never this know. regard i should say 2019 you probably don't remember uh larry but 2019 i interviewed you for Cinegirl magazine and yeah i remember it was about women and i asked him um, what do you think about role of women? Do you have anyone in your camera team? And you had your uh, first assistant, I think, was a woman. And you said, like, you never even, like, think that she's a woman. Like, you treat her like anyone. And we had this amazing conversation that you can find in Cinegirl Instagram about uh, this. So it was really good. You had one of the best answers from all those DPs that I interviewed that year. <laughs> yeah, well, Julie Donovan was my camera assistant forever. Like when I would leave and go to another state or country, sometimes they would say, well, you can bring one person. And she was always the person because obviously focus pulling is essential, but she was so much more than that because she ran the department, but also was like, just not just a friend, but just really somebody who made every single job I worked on better and easier. And, and, and then she moved on to basically wanting to produce. So she sort of retired from camera assisting but um but i've but what she also did was introduce me to an incredible team of of assistants but also a lot of them female assistants that were great and continue to work with me for sure Gary, we received another question about uh, um i forget it <laughs> there uh, were suggestions of book citing that people were putting master of lights and stuff i uh, know uh, it was about the uh, uh, beside of that if you have another books let's uh, mention and it's about the uh, small budget lo low budget film that if you um, somehow you like the project you uh, engage with that project or not i mean i've done some smaller films all throughout my career like obviously i started that way but even once i started making some bigger studio films i've always sort of brought you know found projects in between um because to me a movie's a movie and and in a weird way like a one million dollar movie feels the same as a hundred million dollar movie and, and in a lot of ways in ways that you wouldn't even expect like the hundred million dollar movie yes you have some tools that you don't have on a one million dollar movie but the the having to fit everything into a budget doesn't change trust me it doesn't change i'm making a movie that's not a hundred million dollars but it's certainly not a tiny movie and 
ninety percent of what we talk about is the lack of money. So that doesn't change on any level. So the working within limited resources and time is never going to be different. And at the end of the day, you've got a camera, you've got actors, you've got a handful of people making the movie around the camera, and that's the same on every movie. And so that's very comforting. And it also just means that, like, if you're making small movies, you're probably you know, in a position of experience to make a huge movie too, right? It's just, um, you know, it sometimes it goes into places where sometimes you don't have the experience, but then often you can find people that help you along that way too, you know? Um, and sometimes even with a lot of experience, I did The Hangover, I did, um, I did some movies that were incredibly successful. And when I made went to make Godzilla, in the same way as commercial directors are like, where's the product shots on your reel? Like to show that you can shoot that stuff. The producers on that movie, even though they knew me and knew me well, were like, we want to help find you your team. And I was like, listen, it is what it is. I, I didn't get too bent out of shape about it. And I'm like, and you know, so I was like, all right, you know, and so I didn't get full pick of like some of my crew, you know, and so that happens even on a big level, you know. Also limitation of the equipment. Uh, that work. also, trust me, I'm fighting that right now. And, and and we have money. It's like, it'll be a thing. It, it's, a, it's, it's unfortunately, it's too much of a conversation on some movies because you can really limit your own creativity if you're constantly thinking about the budget. But every movie has to, fit within a certain constraint and so that you as a dp you can't also live in a vacuum you're also responsible for staying within that that amount of money that the production has so it's really a function of attitude and how and how you get there but of course working on small movies and working on big movies you also recognize that th then it just becomes a different challenge of how do i still accomplish something that is in my head with less resources and i think it's all it's all doable. Yes, Roger, limitations, free creativity. Or they create a brand new creativity you didn't think, right? Every, every, trust me, Martin Scorsese is a hero. He's one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. He could take some limitations in these last couple of movies. He might have too many, he may have unlimited limitations in a way that's not necessarily servicing him as a director in the way that when he made, you know, After Hours and, you know, and, and 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 Taxi Driver and stuff, he was forced to do. Larry, what's your relationship with the uh, painting and the, you know, the? I used to be a, I used to be really creative artist when I was young, but I don't do it as do it as much. I used to love drawing. I was a really early in my four, five, six, eight, seven years old. I was a really voracious writer of creative writing and 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 drawing. I was like, couldn't get enough of it. And then I discovered sports and I put it aside. But um, but it's part of like me. But I haven't gone back to it now. When I draw, I realize what a special skill it is to draw and to to create something because like any skill, you have to sort of use it or you lose it. Um, so maybe when I retire or I slow down, I'll start painting or drawing again eat it, more fruit snacks <laughs> it's a nice question the last question Cassidy. <laughs> let's uh you by the way i want to know what that even means eat more fruit snacks it's like somebody is like living in my house and they're like don't eat that chocolate no, no, no. for the set for 13 hours <laughs> set. Oh, yeah. Right, right, right. yeah it was like you know when you like <laughs> have a spy i'm like yeah i haven't eaten that chocolate croissant yet i know it's bad for me um but thank you larry for talking to us i think we have to wrap it up slowly i just yeah. want to mention that larry has all these beautiful caps that you see he has pink and i have uh orange and in um uh, manaki film festival he came with a bag of these caps and i couldn't choose i first chose the pink then i changed my mind because on a day i had a like an orange and a yellow and then i went to a cafe and seamus mcgarvey was there and he had this black one <laughs> and I made him forget the cap, and I stole it from him. So yeah, now I have to. 
<laughs> Larry, I have a question. Yeah. When you are uh, get rid of the um, contract and the um, crew filmmaking, you have a camera or you have a small camera in your pocket in with you. And when you spend how you make your note with a small uh, um, cell phone, mobile, or some small camera that you have when you're alone, you're passing the, you know. Uh, you know, I don't, it's funny. It's like, I used to do that so much when I was younger. And sometimes I don't take enough pictures anymore. It's like maybe because it's my job. And like when I'm on set and sometimes I'll bring, I you know, I have three or four bodies, you know. Sometimes I'll bring my old film body, which is an old Nikon F with me for scouts because I just want to see, again, because I still love the texture of film and the contrast. Sometimes I'll use it as a reference thing, but also I'll bring, I went back to an old 5D. Um, I have the original A7S Sony. I have an old Nikkor body. I have a lot of bodies. But for my scout photos, but sometimes I still just use also use my cell phone for just pictures because that's always with me. I'll t probably take more pictures with my cell phone than anything else. But lately, if I'm feeling like a little uninspired and I need a little inspiration, I take my phone camera and I just go and try to try to go out and just discover some imagery because. I forget that sometimes I just don't do it enough. And when I was doing it young in my days, it was really helpful in in just keeping me inspired and keeping me creating frames. And and I and sometimes I feel like I need to do that more. Maybe I'll do it tomorrow. I have a day off. By the way, somebody asked my favorite movies. I'll give you five movies. Right? These are five gems that you may not have seen right one is being there if you've never seen being there it's incredible right caleb deschanel it's amazing watch it please another one's breaking away amazing film these are all sort of older from when i was young um another one's called straight time which is dustin hoffman and uh he started the movie directing it and then he fired himself shot by owen roisman who's incredible um True Romance, one of my favorite movies of all time. Also very fun to watch. Um, and if you haven't seen Killing of a Sacred Deer, watch it. Although you won't want to watch it twice because it's a horrible movie psychologically. But it's pretty pretty mesmerizing. Uh, but yeah, there you go. I have two questions so short. Uh, when you see saw a film in the past, when you are ch ch in childhood, you find yourself as a, you want to make this picture, you want to be a uh, DOP. No. Or, no. No, that didn't come until, until university. I loved movies. I would, movies were like when I had a birthday, I would have a birthday party and we'd go see movies, right? Like, I remember birthday parties where I'm like, oh, we went to see Close Encounters of the Third Kind, or we, so movies were always a part of my childhood simply because they're so mesmerizing and I love sitting in a theater and watching them, you know, it's the best. Um, but I really didn't get into making movies or even think about it as even a possibility of a career until I was about 20 years old. That was the first time in my, in my head that I ever even thought it was possible. Which film? What film got me there? It was really a class. It wasn't a film that got me there. It was just, I took a class, which was just a survey class about, it was called language of film in my undergraduate studies. And it was like every week we'd watch a movie and then we would sort of talk about it as something, you know, exterminating angel or, you know, whatever it was we watched that week, we would talk about it. And it was the first time in my mind that I started seeing, I had an interest in photography, but I started really recognizing one, that this was something you could do for a living, but also that you could see movies as a, a you know, a collection of their, of their parts. It was like a puzzle and there was a structure to it and there was a craft to it and all that. And then I got really into it. And then that's all I wanted to do was figure out how to become a filmmaker. And because I had an interest in photography, I think cinematography was like natural. And which film that you 
wasn't the DOP you want to be a DOP of that film in the past? Any film? I mean, probably like it's hard to say. I loved Raging Bull, but probably for me, E.T. Because mm. E.T. was like, as a child, was like magical. Not just because it dealt with like it was both emotional, really genuinely emotional. And it was magical because it was dealing with like an alien and this sort of really fantastical idea for a movie. But it was beautiful. Like the the light was active in that movie, right? And the and the storytelling and the way Spielberg directs, but also the way Alan Davio lights, it just felt like this collection of 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 artistry that really spoke to me, you know. Um and it still is a great movie and close encounters along the same line like because again very similarly two movies made by the same filmmaker but they both you know vilmos zigman's cinematography in that movie the 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 you know widescreen and you know spielberg doesn't shoot anamorphic much but that movie is and like also a movie that is an adventure and magical yeah those two films maybe and the family prefer which film of you? My favorite film? No, the family, your family, they they prefer which film of you that That's a, such a good question. I, I don't know. I mean, I think like people respond to Joker because of the course of his success mm -hmm. and and some of the other stuff. My favorite film is Due Date. I rewatched Due Date on the airplane like a like a weirdo. Like my wife is always like, "You're watching one of your own movies." I rewatched the whole movie. I love Due Date, and, uh, and so I, it's like I, you know, that movie still gets me. So lovely yeah. conversation, you know, <laughs> lovely. <laughs> I like Dan in real life too. That's a good one. Yeah, I haven't seen that one either. Have to Dan in real life. The thing about Dan in real life was it was a cool director, this guy Peter Hedges, who's like a playwright and has directed some things. His his son is uh, is a now a really good actor. But um, he had a really cool process. We made the film, 90% of the film takes place in this like house in Newport or near Newport in Rhode Island. And we found a house near a lake and that's where we shot most of the movie in this practical house. And three weeks before we started shooting, he brought all the crew and the crew, production designer, costume designer, everybody, we all basically lived in the house and then did the movie uh, and and as actors in the movie in each in each like part of the house that we were going to shoot in, like almost like a rehearsal for the crew. We wouldn't talk about like where the camera went. We would just do it like a read through, but we did the whole movie. And I played this Steve Carell part. And that was really great. And then, uh, then a week later, they brought the actors in, and we did the same thing with the actors. Uh, and that was just a really fun experience. Yeah, I got to act. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. You know, yeah, you're, really, thank you. Yeah, this was a yeah. pleasure. Thank I think you Sharon guys. loved this. Uh, and they, uh, we gave a discount code, right, Sarah? For the yes, they all will so receive the email. You won't need it until you decide if you want to subscribe. So you can obviously sign up free, tr free trial. That's nothing. It doesn't. No credit card. You don't need anything. But then, if you go, I want to subscribe. Just make sure you put that code in when you subscribe. Yeah, we explained this before you joined. Okay, good, 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 good. And they will receive an email. And um, so many people before the session told me that they just love Shot Deck. It changed their life. Uh, the fact that you know our eyes are trained to high quality is just amazing. And I think this is one of the 21st century biggest successful projects. <laughs> yeah, Seriously. Well, I don't know about that, but thank you. <laughs> By the way, I love hearing people who obviously use the site. I was in the laundry mat this morning in Brooklyn where I'm staying for this movie. And somebody saw my hat and they said, oh, do you work for Shot Deck? And she was a commercial director and she's like, oh, I use Shot Deck. And it was very fun. So I, I, I it's, it's, it's uh, thrilling to hear people who use it and, and are getting something out of it. And it's like the goal is just that it helps you get your next job and helps you do your job better. So that's, that's, that's all I want out of it. Do you have a big team helping you? It's now up to like 10 full-time people. So it's a, it's become a real thing. Yeah. And they I can't do it. I can't sh keep shooting 
without this team that's amazing because obviously i still want to keep doing my day job which is making movies so <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of work yeah and so, so they, they, go, they allow they allow it all to, to happen uh, the process of getting the shots of each film is it like hand like they screenshot yeah. things or is yeah. it a, my no, it's hand done. We decide. It, that's where all our, like the curation of the shots is a big part of it. There's no way to automate it. No. That's you that's can, time consuming. But it, you can do it. But it, what we found is all it does is take a dumb shot every five seconds, 10 seconds, no, five frames, 10 frames, and then you have 10,000 frames. And then you still have to curate down those, right? So there's a curation process that's still just a part of it. Yeah. There probably is, and there are always ways in which we're trying to figure out how to scale in a different way. But what we've tried, what we've discovered is if we went there immediately, it lost the thing that actually makes it, I think, special is that there are human beings behind all the shots and the tagging and all that. So that, well that's done, still a big component to it. So well done to the team. Yeah, I want to mention that uh, through the question, uh, we get the uh, 40 percent discount for shot tech for all the friends that uh through the code of eyes wise uh, uh register in the shot tech thank you for your thank you so much. amazing uh, time that you get very generous of you larry mm. this is going to be recorded and will be available to people this is why we love you you're just like amazing even when you go to a set the reason that you like even a disaster happens you're gonna smile at it and like in a cool really american way you make it fun for everyone and you deal with the situation rather than being really angry and i think that's why we love you and yeah. everything i think larry way it's larry more, way yeah. <laughs> we do it larry way thank you guys Appreciate have it. a great time yeah the people send me the message if uh, we can have larry Mm, another time in eyes wise i think uh it's depend of the time of larry yeah the... i'll be done with this movie in mid-june and then i'll be available good so luck yeah. go. great good luck <laughs> so we cross the finger all of us for uh you and the team larry yeah and joker will come out soon enough and then you guys can we can we can all watch that together you're gonna be we'll hammered it. again with all the interview <laughs> requests Wow, it's going to be crazy. And we'll see you in camera image. Definitely. Sure. Will Joker 2 make it to camera image? I would think so, yes. That would be, that would be a big deal, you know? Wow. Can't wait for that. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you, everyone who joined. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.